Wow, I haven't given a talk to a class this size in uh, quite a while. Um, I, I really like the Codeset presentation. I thought it was a good segue into mine. Uh, I wanted to up the ante a little bit, though. I'm going to use 900 lookup tables to get a speed up of 12x in less than an hour. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to put a standardized vector engine into the processor. Standardized. Oh, well, we don't have one yet. So we're going to propose one that we've created that's quite lightweight. And so that's what this is about. So our RISC-V implementation that we've developed is called ORCA, and it's FPGA optimized. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means it's highly parameterized. We can have many different possible implementations. We just choose the settings at compile time. Because it's an FPGA, we can change it all the time. We've also made great effort to make it area efficient and portable across different vendors. And it's uh, available under an open source license if you want to use it. We've implemented it on a lattice board because this is one of the smallest FPGAs we can find. It only has 3,500 lookup tables and four uh, multipliers. It's a very low cost FPGA. You can get it for about five bucks on DigiKey, I think. Um, and the smallest version of our processor can fit in less than 2,000 lookup tables and it runs about 20 megahertz. So for the vector extensions, we have a number of goals. Uh, the first and foremost with this one is we're trying to produce lightweight vector extensions. So we want it to be area optimized for tiny FPGAs like that lattice chip. I mean significantly less than 10,000 lookup tables in total. And we don't, we're not going to concern ourselves with using external DRAM or anything. This is for tiny embedded systems. We're going to set a goal of about 10x for performance. And we're going to do this not by parallelism, but mostly by eliminating redundant instructions like loads and stores, address calculations, and loop overhead. And we want it to be a natural extension to the RISC-V instruction set. So what we decided to do is add vector instructions in. In particular, we add a vector data storage called a scratch pad. And this is on chip and fast. It runs at the same speed as the CPU. And we're going to reuse the uh, ALU in the RISC-V core. And what we're going to do is stream our data through that ALU from the scratch pad in order to operate on variable length vectors. We're also going to use address generators that are going to index the scratch pad, and they're going to have auto increment features. So you don't have to do any address generation as a separate instruction, and you don't have to do a load or a store to the scratch pad. The data is already there and stays there. So the premise is, is to go back to data level parallelism, where you might have a loop, and you want to iterate over a number of elements in a set and do the same operation to all the elements. Here I'm doing a multiply over eight elements. In a vector parlance, we might set the vector length to 8, and then we do a vector multiply and a destination of A and operand sources of B and C. A, B, and C might be named vector registers. That's the Cray style and the Huacha style. In our case, they're just going to be scalar registers in the RISC-V, and they're going to contain pointers into the scratch pad. So the pointer is the starting address of the vector. This allows us to use the, the scratch pad very flexibly. We can have any number of vectors starting at any address of any length. And there's no restrictions in the ISA on that. And the only difference is how big of a scratch pad you want to make in your implementation. We're uh, building an accelerator for just 1D vectors, but there's natural extensions to 2 and 3D matrices if you want. Um, the address generator is going to be doing useful work in taking instructions out of the inner loop to save us uh, space and performance. And right now, we're only operating on 32-bit data, but you can imagine 8-bit and 16-bit and fixed-point extensions of this. So with our vector of 8, if we had four ALUs in parallel, the hardware could decide to use uh, two clock cycles to do a vector multiply like this. In our case, we're only going to have one ALU, and it'll iterate for eight cycles. But it's going to auto-increment the sources and the dest address in the process. These are the instructions that we've vectorized. We've taken the um, I base instructions and added a V in front of them. And they're mostly the arithmetic type instructions of add, subtract, XOR, and whatnot. Uh, we decided that the ALU has a set less than feature, so we'll also vectorize that so we can do conditional uh, things. Uh, for the M class instructions, there's multiply and divide. Um, our particular divider is not pipeline, so it's not really useful, but it's free because it's in the ALU already. We also added conditional move on zero and conditional move on non-zero. That's useful for some uh, types of calculations. Um, and then we have to actually encode our vector instructions. 
all of our vector instructions are using the 32-bit instruction set in the extension 1 category. And we needed more opcode space than was, was available in the 32 bits. So we actually used two 32-bit bundles to designate a vector op. The first bundle is called vtype. And this sets the data types and, and the source registers, actually. And then we do one of the vector add or vector sub, and that sets the destination register and the vector length. Now we can do extensions to 2D and 3D by adding four more instructions. That set up, sets up the strides. So what's the system model? System models, we have this RISC-V processor called ORCA. It's uh, R32IM. And what we're going to do is we're going to steal the ALU out of that, and we're going to use it. And we're going to add some memory called a scratch pad and tightly couple that be able to provide data into that ALU in a pipeline fashion. Next to the scratch pad are going to be these address generators that get initialized by the V-type instruction, for example. So the data will be read out one, operation, uh, one uh, set of values, two inputs and one output uh, per cycle, and stream through the pipeline ALU. There's a separate memory, the data memory, which is also on chip. That's for the normal scalar data. All the vector data is going to be in the scratch pad, and only, only the scratch pad has the vector operations. And they just have different addresses in the address space. Let's say we want to allocate some vector data. We just use a different version of malloc. In this case, we call ours VBX SP malloc, and you say the number of bytes that you want to get, and you can assign that to a vector data type. We have a C API and a C++ API. They're sort of like intrinsics. Uh, you can allocate memory in the scratch pad, and then you can set your vector length. And then all the vector operations use the intrinsic uh, prefix VBX for C or VBXX for C++. There's a type designator for C, which can get inferred in C++. So this is a vector-to-vector -vector operation with word size operands. And then vector add is our example of a vectorized instruction with a destination pointer, source one pointer, and source two pointer. Those pointers are actually C scalar pointers, and they reside in the scalar register file of the RISC-V. That makes it very easy for the C compiler to manipulate these values and us to generate assembly code without actually modifying the assembler very much. We also have a C++ object layer where you can just use uh, plus, minus, and, and regular operations that are overloaded. Compared to the base scalar processor, ORCA, uh, we've added 900 lookup tables. We went up from 2,900 to 3,800. We're using the same number of block RAMs for instruction and for data. And we've added some extra RAM in there for the scratch pad. And that's parameterized, so it's as big as you want it to be. Uh, in both cases, the clock cycle on, on the chip is about 17 megahertz. And we implement a 32-tap fur filter. It takes 15 cycles per tap on the original RISC-V. We get that down to 1.25 cycles per tap with our vector instructions. So that's a speed up of 12x for 900 lookup tables. The code looks like before and after like this. I'm just showing the assembly code. The innermost loop is the black box. There's eight instructions, and there's some stalls in there. And that um, takes uh, 72 bytes to encode that inner loop. With the vector extensions, the inner loop is actually just two instructions. And then it stalls for as many cycles as needed. So there's only one, uh, two instruction fetches. Um, and uh, 20 bytes to encode it. So it ends up being more compact as well. So 12 times faster, less code, um, less instruction fetches, less pressure on the instruction memory. Uh, so lower power overall. Looking forward, uh, we want to add 2D operations and maybe 3D operations to get faster outer loops on this. We want to break up the word into half words and bytes to get uh, SIMD level parallelism on that to get two or four X of performance. We're thinking about adding an option for a second ALU to double performance again. And we have some advanced conditional flags in mind that we want to consider putting in. We've generally designed this to be forwards compatible with our big vector accelerator called the MXP. Uh, I'll talk about that in a talk tomorrow. Um, and just a little note, why didn't we go with Huacha? Uh, well, the vector, detailed vector proposal isn't really out yet for us to implement, and we wanted to do something very lightweight, and we think the uh, things that we've done here keep the area down and make better use of what's uh, available. The scratch pad, for example, 
can have as many vectors of any, as any length that you want, so you can make more efficient use of the space. If your vector is short, you're not going to waste any space at the end of a hard-coded vector. Also, Huache uses named vector registers, which uh, encodes the vector names into the ISA. So if you have one vectorized function and you want to call another vectorized function to assist you, you have to make sure there's no clash in the vector names that you're being used, or you need to spill the data, or you need to have some type of register renaming. Um, we don't have to do that. Instead, we treat that scratch pad like a stack, and when we call another library function, we just allocate more space in the scratch pad like a stack. When we return, we free that memory up, like popping off a stack. And so our, our vectorized functions are composable. One can call the other. So in summary, we've proposed uh, a RISC-V processor at the last RISC-V meeting, and that's available now. Um, we've put a little more work into it. We've added these lightweight vector extensions. It's not quite done yet. We still have a little bit more uh, testing and debugging to do, and a few more features we want to implement. But we're getting pretty good performance with pretty low overhead of about uh, 10x performance and less than 1,000 LUTs extra in the implementation. Um, we can make it scalable to add even more performance with a little bit more area, and we give a migration path towards the larger accelerator. That th that's it. Thank you. Question off the bat. Hi, um, Jens Lee from Sci-Fi. Have you thought about the issues of running your code on a machine with a smaller scratch pad? So for example, does the alloc function can return a null? And you said about it also has the same kind of issues with your composability argument. What if you run out of your scratch pad to allocate vector registers? Yeah, it's just like running out of RAM in a regular program. You go, oops. <laughs> Um, basically, when you write your vector library, it, you know if you're a leaf function that you're not calling any other functions. And so what you normally do is you query the scratchpad library, say, how much space do I have left? Um, I'm going to need uh, four vectors in that space, so you take the space divided by four and you allocate your vector size as that. And that works pretty well. If you're not a leaf function, if you're something that's going to call another vector library, you know you have to leave it some space, and so you have to do a little bit of math. So there's a little bit of implicit dependence on what that scratch pad's capacity is going to be. You want to make sure it's big enough that you don't run out. But it's like having DRAM in an embedded system. You just take care. Are you also considering support for, uh, <coughs> yes. for sparse uh, vectors? No, we haven't looked at sparseness yet. Uh, everything has to be dense in this case all the address generators, except when you go to 2D and 3D and you have a second increment value, then you can go sparse, so you could do a, a, a subarray within a bigger 2D array, for example, and you could skip the ending of the rows. Question down here in the front. Uh, Rich here, Nick Hill from BlueSpec. Uh, what about, uh, can these instructions trap, raise exceptions? I'm sorry? Can these instructions raise exceptions? And Can these so instructions raise exceptions? We haven't thought that far along yet. Um, since they're just repeating something in the ALU, you could have something go wrong, so there could be something like a divide by zero. Um, we, we haven't considered how to handle that yet. So what's the point in, uh, I understand Scratch, but is uh, faster, but why not put it in main memory? I mean, as an option, what's, what's limiting that? In this case, it's mostly uh, the, in, in these really small FPGAs, you have very limited uh, amounts of block RAM that's on chip. Um, and if you make a bigger block RAM by composing them, then you end up adding multiplexers and slowing things down. Um, and you also need to add uh, multiplexers on the addresses to have different sources for the addresses and whatnot. So there is a way to have a unified address space in, in this case, but it's a little bit more design complexity. On the bigger system, when we have a bigger accelerator, we actually have this as being a banked area of memory that we can do parallel readout from, and you can't do that with main memory. So there's a definite reason to have it separate in that case. Uh, Charlie Su from Endis Technology. Um, two questions. One is uh, what happens uh, when the, the, there's an interrupt? And the other one is why just limit it to FPGA? Uh, we're interested in FPGAs because then we can actually make product at cells that everybody can use because we can't afford to make chips. Um, as for what happens when you get an interrupt in the middle, I'm actually not sure of, uh, how we define that behavior at the moment. We are teetering behind, one, just let the vector run to the end because it's going to be a short vector because it's a small embedded system, <laughs> or interrupt it and resume. And I don't remember what the final decision was or, or whether that's even finalized and we have to still look at that. I'm sorry. Hey, Michael Pellauer, NVIDIA. 
So uh, it seems to me that on some level what you've done is you've made a two-way superscalar microarchitecture where you've dedicated one of the ALUs to do address generation and one to do the al actual operation. Uh, two source and one dest address, so there's three address generators. Three address. So and it's then like there's a, a branch and a loop counter that's also in parallel, so that's five ops yeah, in so, parallel. So, so I, think that, I think it would be very illuminating for your 12x speed up number to compare it first against the baseline, but then against a, a, a multi-issue pipeline with traditional superscalar issue. Which would never fit in this FPGA because of the hazard detection and uh, stall overheads. Which would be interesting data in itself, in itself, itself but yeah. you know, we're not just interested in FPGAs, we're interested in ASICs. And of course, sure. a lot of things that are actually inefficient on ASIC and FPGAs can actually be implemented more efficiently on ASICs. Sure. And if so you're going I, I with an ASIC and you have a lot more area available, I would, I would say use our, our, our big accelerator that I'm not talking about here. Mm -hmm. No, so no, I, I just think it's So I'm just saying that there's another point. path to get even more parallelism in out of that. In some sense, I think what, what I'm asking for in some level is an area normalized comparison against a traditional architecture. So you had the baseline and you had yeah. your, your enhanced solution, which was bigger but you didn't have a, a normal but bigger I, I Yeah, I, I understand. We, yeah. yeah, Rocket doesn't fit on this chip. That's right, right. Yeah, no, yeah. no I, I think that, that would be really illuminating to have that data, too. Yeah. Uh, Yansup, do you know the area of the Rocket core on the micro semi board on the big one, just off tents? Just for comparison? Right. I think it was 3,000 LUTs. We've been optimizing for FPGAs recently, but yeah. yeah, that's awesome. But I mean, okay, just I think it's um, I think we should think hard about that. Rocket is just a design point of implementing RISC V, as you said, right? You can build a FPGA optimized RISC V core. So yeah, there was a question previously about uh, sparse vectors and it's sort yeah. of follow up. So if you have uh, any plans uh, to if go If there's a constant direction. stride between your elements, this will handle it when we add the 2D and 3D uh, okay. capability. Um, but if you want more parallelism, then you have to have these wave fronts of contiguous elements and we don't have a solution for that right now. Okay, so I I if not, then uh, what is, maybe you can comment, what is the uh, envisioned primary use uh, uh, a lot of the dense stuff is, is things like audio processing, image video processing. Thanks, Guy. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs>